We've arrived at a point in history at which you can watch an NFL game and not know which year you're in. The pandemic spoiled that to a degree last season, but even then, once the camera pulled in tight, there was usually no way to know. This is a rarity in live television, one of the purest and most unfettered windows into our culture. The news, of course, is a dead giveaway. Depending on what our health trends are, QVC is selling something that cooks burgers with more or less fat. SNL mostly reenacts stuff that happened last Tuesday. Even in the NBA, once the 6'8 power forward puts up a 3, you have your answer. The effects of time tend to vanish within the NFL, and they vanish even further within the Falcon-Saints rivalry. Since 1992, each one of these games has been played under a dome, so you don't even know what time of day it is. Now, early on, there are plenty of clues. There's a little inset pointed to the stadium clock instead of a score bug, the aspect ratio is different, and the analog broadcast is fuzzier. A couple years later, the Fox box shows up. At the time, it was divisive, but if they tried to broadcast a game without it today, we'd all flip out. They play around with this a couple times until ultimately setting the score up top. By 2005, all the bells and whistles come standard. We've got the yellow first and 10 line and the down and distance marker, but it's still visibly dated, and it stays that way until 2008. This is the point at which the football novice might confuse what we're seeing here with a broadcast from 2021. The definition is much crisper, the aspect ratio is 16 to 9, and the graphics package generally passes for something you might see today. This is when the present day began. We can now flip on the game and experience a world unmoored to time. There's a real comfort in this. For a few hours a week, millions of us escape into a world outside of our own, where the realities of our own world just don't exist. This isn't a quality unique to the Falcons in particular, but their story is both entirely non-fictional and not entirely real. So far, we've told a story that's stretched from 1966 to 2007, decades of extraordinary developments in our world, and we've touched on basically none of them. We've tugged at a few things in the periphery, sure, a new wave of religion, the evolution of music, the construction boom, we even took a couple wide tangents to poke at the military-industrial complex and the justice system, but we had to reach a little bit, didn't we? It's hard work turning our Pinocchio into a real boy. On top of their aesthetical consistency, Falcon Saints games have maintained a consistent tenor, with both teams hating the hell out of each other regardless of how well either team is actually doing. But there was one exception. One moment in which you know exactly when you are in history. On this night in 2006, the Falcons did get to witness firsthand what it looked like when a team became real, when a team was unmistakably anchored in its time and place. The city of New Orleans was recovering from the death and devastation of Hurricane Katrina. It was the Saints' first game back in the Superdome. They couldn't repair the damage or hold anyone responsible. What they could do, though, was deliver a symbolic victory and give the people of their city something to believe in, some place to express their pride. The Falcons came in hot, having started 2-0 with two decisive wins. But the Saints forced a 3-and-out on the Falcons' opening drive, setting up a punt deep in Atlanta territory. Almost nothing can change a game's momentum more than a punt block. On account of how chaotic and how extraordinarily rare it is in the NFL, it always gets a huge pop from the home crowd. There was no better time for the Saints' Steve Gleason to emerge from nowhere and sprint right up the gap. Before you hear this, remember that this is the first quarter of a regular season game. Look out! Right through! This is not how a football crowd sounds. Not at this phase in the game. This is a celebration of life. As their hated rival, the Falcons' role in these proceedings was to lose and lose badly. And they did, 23-3. I hope they paid close attention to the Saints that night. Because one night, years into the future, this would be them. After the chaos of the Mora and Petrino years, the Falcons had no choice but to hit the reset button heading into 2008, and they hit it hard. In week one, their starting quarterback was Matt Ryan, a 23-year-old kid they pulled out of Boston College. Here's his first ever pass in an NFL regular season game. Knock him dead, buddy. Ryan back for his first NFL pass attempt. It's complete to Michael Jenkins, and he breaks a big one. Holy shit. We're virtually certain that this is the first time an NFL quarterback's first ever throw has gone for a touchdown of longer than 50 yards. What this was, was exactly what it felt like. The first step of a very, very long ascent to the mountaintop. On 
On their very next possession, they snap off another 60-yard touchdown. This one comes on the ground from a running back who demonstrates an ability to make quick cuts, the Jets to elude would-be tacklers, and the size to bounce right off another would-be tackler. Michael Turner arrived in Atlanta after four years in San Diego. When he got to play, he was terrific, but he was never going to put up big numbers backing up the great LaDainian Tomlinson. Now in his first ever game as a Falcon, Turner is immediately showing what he can do as a stud back. That 66-yard scoot was only the start of a 220-yard effort that ranks among the 50 best single-game rushing performances in modern times. En route to a 34-21 win, Ryan and Turner were having a party on day one. But there was a third breakout hit who'd been around a few years but was now becoming an NFL superstar. In the third quarter, he hauls in his very first ever deep ball from Matt Ryan to help put the game away. It'll be the first of many. Whoop, looks like we've got Roddy in the middle of a backflip. You know, no, no, stay put, stay put. We will come to you. The Falcons had drafted wide receiver Roddy White in the first round out at UAB a few years earlier, and 2008 marked his second season as a full-time starter. While he was drafted by a team that historically had a dearth of strong traditional pocket passers, especially so coming off that circus of a 2007 season, Ryan was a godsend. The two instantly developed a mind-melding chemistry with one another from day one, and for the ensuing half-decade, arguably no one in the NFL but Calvin Johnson was a more dangerous receiving weapon than was Roddy White. Once again, we've got a Falcons team with a great quarterback and some great offensive playmakers. What we could use now is a normal head coach. We've had enough weird coaches. As much as I enjoyed the Jim Mora and Bobby Petrino odysseys, these guys deserve better. We need the standard package. We need a creative coach. <clears throat> Computer, generate normal guy. I'm an enthusiast of bullshit, but even I need a break, and we found that in Mike Smith. The most inflammatory thing he ever did as the Falcons coach was to make the occasional call that some found too conservative. Every human being is interesting in one way or another, and I'm sure that in his personal life, he had his quirks. When he gathered around for a family game night, maybe he picked a wheelbarrow piece in Monopoly or something. I have no clue. But as a coach, he was just a good coach who was well-liked by his players and everyone else around him. So we'll keep it short with him, which I suspect he'd be just fine with, and focus instead on what he did, which was win a lot of football games. In 2008, the Falcons immediately rebounded from 4-12 to 11-5. Their defense was transformed from one of the league's worst into a unit that was actually capable of keeping points off the board, thanks in part to the career renaissance of John Abraham. At defensive end, Abraham averaged a full sack per game, more than almost anyone else in the league, and as a veteran, his quiet leadership reflected the personality of these new Falcons. They were bounced out of the playoffs in the first round, but after a season like this, it was tough to feel all that sad about it. On top of that, they fell to the Cardinals, who were on their way to their first Super Bowl appearance ever. You think the Falcons wing is sad? Well. Wait till you see the Cardinals wing. You have not even begun to know pain. The Cardinals were the Jacob Marley of the NFL, having sadly wandered around America for nearly a century. They began as the Chicago Cardinals, then actually merged with the Steelers in desperation during World War II, then went back to Chicago, then moved to St. Louis, then moved to Phoenix, then changed their name to the Arizona Cardinals. All the while, they did virtually nothing but lose, once enduring a 50-year stretch in which they didn't win a single playoff game. This, then, was a priority case. You just gotta let them play through. If you're ever tempted to believe the Falcons are somehow cursed, remember that it could be so, so much worse. I mean, hell. At least the Atlanta Falcons know where they live. To this point, this team had been defined, almost without exception, by inconsistency and instability. But as it would turn out for five years straight, the head coach was Mike Smith, the top passer was Matt Ryan, the top rusher was Michael Turner, and the top receiver was Roddy White. This is almost completely unprecedented. If you count up the streaks like this that only last three seasons, the list is fairly short. The Marv Levy, Jim Kelly, Thurman Thomas, Andre Reid Bills are the only team to ever do what these Falcons did between 2008 and 2012. And of course, those Bills went to the Super Bowl four times. Entering the 2009 season, the Falcons went out and got Matt Ryan another weapon. I'm a Chiefs fan, and I was just happy to see Tony Gonzalez get the trade he asked for and finish his Hall of Fame career somewhere other than those putrid Kansas City teams of that era. Even in his final seasons with the Falcons, he was putting up numbers most tight ends can only dream of. Gonzalez revolutionized his position kind of in the way Vic did. There had been incredible pass-catching tight ends before, guys like Shannon Sharp, but Gonzalez was the one to establish proof of concept. Where he went, the likes of Antonio Gates and Rob Gronkowski followed. 
In this season, the Falcons didn't quite match their 2008 success, and they missed the playoffs. But you know what? They finished with a 9-7 record, which meant that for the first time in the 44-year history of this team, the Atlanta Falcons had finished with a winning record in back-to-back -back seasons. This is called sustained momentum. Almost every other NFL team does this all the damn time, and now, after nearly half a century, the Falcons finally get to experience what it's like. They did leave a little bit on the table, though. In particular, they dropped both their matchups with the Saints. In both of them, New Orleans escaped by the skin of their teeth. The first time, the Falcons recovered an onside kick with about a minute left and a last second throw was picked off near the goal line. At the end of the second one, the Falcons were stuffed on a fourth and two in Saints territory. These two games decided who won the NFC South that season. If Atlanta had found a way to win them, the two teams would have tied at 11-5 and, and it would have been the Falcons who held the tiebreaker and went to the playoffs. Instead, the Saints are going, well, best of luck to them, but we don't need it. We understand now that success is about more than simply making the playoffs. It's about long-term stability and positive momentum and steady leadership. We're set up for success, slow and steady. Before long, we'll have this team in the position- Oh, God damn it! The New Orleans Saints had won the space race just when the Falcons had discovered fire. While the Falcons were turning the corner, the Saints had ripped off a million wins in a row and won the first Super Bowl they'd ever played in. What happened to the old days, when the big brother got to shove around the little brother just for fun? And what about the more recent times, when the two were partners in misery, giving the rest of the country barn burners to watch on national television, all the while drifting out of view in the standings? They had a special thing going. All that was gone. Had just a couple of plays broken differently in that season, the Falcons could have prevented this. They did not. I've always thought hating someone or something was such an extreme feeling that takes a lot of effort and energy. Like as a kid, I guess I hated vegetables, but now if you give me some deliciously seasoned charred broccoli, it can elevate any meal. To hate something, you have to passionately dislike it. And I ain't gonna spend time holding a grudge against green things. I just didn't like them. But when it comes to the Saints, oh yeah. I absolutely hate that team. And this isn't to give Saints fans some sense of satisfaction like, oh, look at us living rent-free in the heads of Falcons fans. Because I don't think about y'all at all. It's just when you battle with a team two times a year every season, you start to learn their tendencies and how they operate. And yeah, the hate starts to build. It's only natural. So let's just say I don't really have any recollection of the Saints winning the Super Bowl. That's new information to me. But what I do remember is members of the Saints staff paying players to purposely injure players of the opposing team. And that just coincidentally occurred during the same years of this so-called Super Bowl win. Seems a little fishy if you ask me. Well, our bird has one hell of a blemish now, huh? We would love to remove it. Unfortunately, we lack the technology to do so, rendering this completely impossible. The next season, it was as though the Falcons were pulled into the Saints' wake, regardless of how good they actually were. In terms of wins, it was the second best season they'd ever had. What's weird, though, is that in a lot of respects, they weren't actually good. Remember those 04 Falcons who earned a postseason bye despite a point differential of just plus three for the season? Well, you ain't seen nothing yet. In 2010, the Falcons won 13 games, good enough to secure the NFC's number one seed and home field advantage throughout the playoffs. Normally you'd equate such status with being extremely good at football, but on a play-by-play -play assessment of their offense and defense, they were not extremely good. They were not even extremely average. They were extremely bad. Offensively, the 2010 Falcons failed to average even five yards per play, ranking 26th in the league. Defensively, they ranked 27th, allowing 5.56 yards per play. That differential was the fifth worst in the NFL that season. Again, accomplished by a number one seed. Also, hey there, Chargers. But let's zoom out for a sec beyond 2010 and look at every season of every team since the merger, because that's where I noticed something real weird. As you'd expect, you can see quite a strong positive correlation between this metric and winning. 
So these falcons are a glaring exception to be this far to the left, yet still having won over 80% of their games. Allow me to direct your attention to this dot way down here for a comparison. That would be a winless team with a per play yardage differential that wasn't just better, but significantly better than a 13 win Falcons team. It's pretty easy to recognize the prime culprit for such an outlandish discrepancy, turnovers. The 2017 Browns had a turnover differential of minus 28. Atlanta in 2010 had an outstanding turnover differential of plus 14. And while obviously those are huge plays that have an enormous impact on outcomes, the fact remains that fundamentally on a play-by-play -play amalgam of both sides of the ball, those top-seeded Falcons were arguably a lot worse than a team led by Deshaun Kaiser. The ultimate microcosm of their season came in week four against my beloved Niners in a game that will forever be tattooed on my brain. With the Falcons down one and a minute and a half left to play, San Francisco's Nate Clements picks off Matt Ryan. If we freeze it right there, this is a situation where at this point, a pick six isn't even necessarily a bad thing for the Falcons. You're already losing with a little over a minute left, and it'd at least enable a chance to get the ball back, still likely just a one possession game. But already deep in Atlanta territory, in Clements's furious quest to score a perhaps detrimental touchdown, he slows up just enough to allow a hustling Roddy White to punch the ball loose. Falcons recover, go down the field, kick the game-winning field goal. Their back-breaking turnovers weren't even turnovers. Those were the 2010 regular season Falcons. Wonder if that's the type of squad that gets exposed in January. On to the 2010 playoff Falcons. Coming off their bye week, the Falcons are set to battle the Packers, and their fairy tale season continues early when Turner bounces off hits from every angle and keeps his legs churning till he hits pay dirt. Even though Green Bay immediately responds with an Aaron Rodgers touchdown pass to Jordy Nelson, on the ensuing kickoff, Atlanta breaks the record for longest postseason touchdown in NFL history when Eric Weems goes 102 yards right up the middle, nearly untouched. But the Falcons are facing a future Hall of Fame quarterback at the peak of his powers, and they're simply unable to provide any resistance as Rodgers leads his team downfield to again tie it. It's pretty clear that Atlanta's only hope is for Matt Ryan to keep up in a shootout, but when he tries to hit Michael Jenkins on a fly route against cover two, he puts a little too much air on it and Jenkins slips, which allows underneath cornerback Tremont Williams to make a touchdown saving play on the ball, something the Falcons can ill afford given just how scorching hot the opposing quarterback is. Atlanta is powerless to prevent Green Bay from surging ahead on another pinpoint Rodgers touchdown pass with less than a minute to go in the first half. Then, the sky comes tumbling down. Just seconds remain until halftime, and the Falcons are trying to shorten a field goal try with no timeouts and thus needing to throw toward the sideline. Tremont knows exactly what's coming and baits Ryan into throwing the quick out to Roddy White. One slick cut back later, and the man whose pick two minutes earlier saved a touchdown is now scoring one of his own in the most demoralizing way possible to end a half. It would be just about impossible for a single play to change a football game more than this one did. Before this throw, it was anyone's game, with the Falcons likely to, at minimum, kick a field goal to cut the deficit to four. Instead, within a matter of seconds, it was 14. Absolutely backbreaking, especially with the Packers set to receive first in the second half. The rest of the game was a procession, with Aaron Rodgers and his offense scoring at will. This is a really amazing relic. About half of it was a very close game, and yet it went into the books as a 27-point defeat, the worst home playoff loss seen in the NFL in decades. After a year of threading the needle, the football gods had shown up at the worst possible time to collect what was owed. Following that season of fool's gold, the Falcons sought to make a big splash in the 2011 NFL Draft to upgrade at wide receiver opposite Roddy White. General Manager Thomas Dimitrov would stop at nothing to get his man, and his level of determination wouldn't have been justified for many players, but oh 
goodness, was it justified here. Because here, we're talking about Julio Jones. As the nation's top high school wide receiver, Jones could have played collegiately anywhere he wanted, and Nick Saban was able to keep the Alabama native in state with the Crimson Tide in 2008. Jones immediately burst on the scene as a true freshman, accounting for nearly 40% of the aerial yardage of a 12-win team. He combined everything you could ever want in a wide receiver. Ideal size and strength, impeccably precise and crafty route running, and even on a broken foot at the 2011 scouting combine, blazing fast sub 4-4 speed in the 40. To get him, Dimitrov was forced to dangle an awful lot of draft pick eggs in one basket, enough to get the Cleveland Browns to bite. Moving all the way up from 27 to 6, the Atlanta Falcons had secured the right to draft Julio Jones. Well, as it relates to overall body of work for a wide receiver, it's really Jerry Rice and everyone else. You can make one hell of a case that Julio Jones had the greatest peak of anyone ever. For starters, there's not a single number between 5,785 and 12,896 in which Julio Jones didn't reach that number of career receiving yards faster than anyone. Let's take as an example 12,000. Jones got there in career game number 125. To reach 12K so quickly, Jones had 5,500 100 yard games in that time when no one else has ever hit the century mark in receiving yardage in more than 45 of their first 125 career games. And in fact, whereas he'd surpassed 12,000 career receiving yards, no one else has ever even topped 11K at that point. Which, by the way, Julio only needed 115 games to reach. He hit that 12,000 milestone near the end of 2019. That was his ninth season. Not only is that comfortably the most ever through nine seasons, but he did that despite missing most of his third season after re-injuring the same foot that was broken when he ran 40 yards in under 4.4 seconds. To still be able to pull that off once he came back in 2014, it would require going absolutely supernova on the rest of the league. And that is exactly what Julio Jones did. Starting with that first season back, he became the only player to ever top 1,400 receiving yards in five consecutive seasons, and was damn close to a sixth when only Marvin Harrison's done so in as many as four consecutive. In that time, he also had three different games topping 250 receiving yards. The following nine players have combined for zero career games with at least 250 receiving yards. DeAndre Hopkins, Isaac Bruce, Anquan Bolden, Michael Irvin, Randy Moss, Torrey Holt, Marvin Harrison, Larry Fitzgerald, and Chris Carter. The latter three never even reached 200 in a game. Julio had three with over 250. However, the two names often considered for the title as second greatest receiver ever are Moss and Terrell Owens. And the main reason for this is touchdowns. Here is every instance an NFL player has ever recorded at least 1,400 receiving yards in a season. Julio shows up five times. Even if he didn't frequently finish his catches in the end zone, Julio Jones still likely had the greatest prime of all time at gobbling up receiving yards. In 2011, Matt Ryan connected with Julio, Roddy, and Tony on his way to more than 4,000 passing yards. This was the Falcons' fourth straight winning season, and it culminated in one of the most frustrating viewing experiences in the history of the NFL. Viewer discretion advised, this game fucking sucks. The Giants played host in New Jersey's MetLife Stadium, a place you can only get to by taking 45 different trains, forging an alliance with an elven tribe that allows you safe passage, and receiving the assistance of a kindly wizard. New York and Atlanta spend the first quarter playing ping pong, with neither offense doing much of anything. The Falcons finally piece together a long drive, and deep in Giants territory, Mike Smith does something atypical. He goes for it on fourth and one. Although they're in field goal range, I do like this call, but this time the Giants stop him. 
Unfortunately for the Giants, the ball itself doesn't change directions. A holding call backs them up to their own 14, Eli Manning drops back, the Falcons send James Sanders after him, and Eli tries to dump it off to nowhere before he can escape the tackle box. He does this while in the end zone, which by rule gives the Falcons the ultra-rare playoff safety, as well as one of the funniest leads possible in a football game. Two to nothing. When the Falcons get the ball back, Matt Ryan marshals the Falcons back into Giants territory. Once again, they find themselves at fourth and one. They're just outside of field goal range. They should absolutely go for it. Remember, they have a terrific quarterback in Matt Ryan. They have Michael Turner, an excellent short yardage option who's having another incredible year. They have Tony Gonzalez, one of the most sure-handed receiving targets the sport has ever seen. If they really want to get weird, they've got the dynamic duo of Roddy White and Julio Jones, who form one of the very best wide receiver tandems ever assembled. But, likely scared off by the Giants stopping them a few minutes ago, the Falcons say no to all of these options and punt it away instead. It's a really, truly nauseating decision, and it's the precise moment the Atlanta Falcons turn into a pumpkin. The Giants score 24 unanswered points as Atlanta's star-studded offense completely breaks down at every opportunity. In the third quarter, the Falcons find themselves at 4th and 1 in Giants territory a third time, but it's too late. Having already committed the cardinal sin of punting on 4th and 1 in enemy territory, there was no appeasing the football gods. They turn the ball over on downs, and that's it. Final score, Giants 24, Falcons 2. Teams have certainly been beaten far worse, but this Falcons effort was so anemic that few living people have seen its equal. Consider this. We have a game here in which a team committed zero turnovers, and yet scored zero offensive points and didn't even attempt a single field goal. Forget just playoff games, even across regular seasons, this is one of just 23 such performances ever. And with 247 yards, they're tied for the most offensive yardage gained in such a game. In other words, the Falcons did the most you could possibly do without doing anything. Most beatdowns can be explained away by turnovers, but not only did they not turn the ball over, they didn't even try one field goal. This is the only time this has ever happened in the playoffs. And it happened despite all of this talent. Now, this is typically a tipping point for the Falcons, the point at which a horrendous playoff loss precipitates a collapse. Once again, it was clear, these Falcons were different. After spending close to half a century failing to cobble together just two straight winning seasons, they've now put together five straight. And the latest is a 2012 campaign that ends with a 13-3 record, their second in three years. It's the wildest thing. It's as though the instant the Falcons entered high definition in 2008, they got serious. They won consistently. And aside from the occasional insensitive tweet from Roddy White, they were the least provocative team you could imagine. They were a talented team that was sensibly coached. Their wins were proficient and their losses were dull. And I'll be honest, at this point in the story, I find that heartbreaking. We can't have both, can we? It could never have happened this way. We couldn't have all these weirdos, all this chaos, all the vibrance that breathed life into this team if we wanted them to win. It's not that these Falcons are lifeless, far from it, they're often really fun to watch, but they're grown up now. This is one of the greatest fears many of us have as we grow up ourselves, that in order to make it, in order to get to where we want, we're going to have to surrender a piece of ourselves. We'll have to hand over a lot of what makes us who we are, or at least who we thought we were. But this is, after all, what we wanted all this time. With another crack at home field advantage throughout the postseason, the Falcons' first playoff game is against the Seahawks. Gonzalez, who's trying to put the finishing touches on a 16-year Hall of Fame career with his first ever taste of postseason success, hauls in the game's first touchdown with some immaculate footwork. The next play run by the offense is a handoff to reserve back Jaquiz Rogers, who unleashes a truck stick from the depths of hell unto safety Earl Thomas on a massive gain to set up another score and a 13-zip lead. After stuffing Seattle's fullback on 4th and 1, Atlanta takes a commanding 20-point lead when rowdy Roddy White slips behind Richard Sherman for the long score. The two teams each trade TDs in the third quarter, so the Falcons maintain their huge 20-point cushion heading into the fourth. That is where they fall apart like a house of cards, allowing a couple touchdowns within the first few minutes as their lead dwindles to six.
With Atlanta's offense stuck in neutral, Seattle's able to take the lead with just 31 seconds remaining when Marshawn Lynch plows in for their third unanswered touchdown of the quarter. The Falcons are staring straight down the barrel of becoming the first team to ever lose a playoff game after squandering a 20-point fourth quarter lead. But life in the NFL is different when you have a franchise quarterback. You are never out of a game, even if you need more yards for a field goal attempt than there are seconds left on the clock. This is Matt Ryan's opportunity to show the entire country that that's exactly what he is. A laser to the left sideline on a deep out gets him to midfield before a 19-yard completion to the ultimate security blanket moves him into field goal range. Tony Gonzalez has just made the catch to set up what may be his first ever playoff win in a Hall of Fame career that could otherwise end without one. It all comes down to kicker Matt Bryant, whose game-winning attempt sails wide right. But wait, Seattle had called timeout to try and ice him, which backfires as Bryant gets another shot, and this time appears to kick them to the NFC Championship. That puts the score at Falcons 30, Seahawks 28, and that will indeed be the final score. Falcons win. However, what follows in this game is an event that's very much like that Deion Sanders circus play in the 1991 playoffs at the end of that game against the Saints. Because that one didn't affect the result, the outright lunacy of it has been lost in the sands of time. Similarly, no one remembers what happens at around 4 p.m. Eastern on January 13th, 2013. It's important to stress here once again that Mike Smith, while a good coach, has a reputation for being an overly conservative coach. Just a year ago, his refusal to go for it on 4th and 1 way downfield signaled the beginnings of a blowout. This is just one of many factors that make this one of the very strangest things I've ever seen anyone do on any football field anywhere. I mean, this is probably number two on the list. Number one is everything that happened in the last Boy Scout. Number two is this. With a two-point lead and eight seconds left in the ball game, the Falcons are set to kick off. The call here is a complete no-doubter that any normal team would make without even thinking about it. You kick it into the end zone, or better yet, through the end zone for a touchback. That would put the Seahawks at their own 20 with just eight seconds to get into field goal range, about 50 yards away. Even with their timeouts, eight seconds would maybe be enough for one play before the field goal. This would be a virtually hopeless situation for Seattle. Now the Seahawks return man is Leon Washington, one of the best returners ever. What if kicker Matt Bosher doesn't kick it far enough, allowing for the chance of a return? Well, it's a very safe bet that he will. In fact, here's him doing so in this very game. Here's him doing so a second time in this game. Here's a third time. A fourth time. He has done this five times today. Not an issue. Okay, well, what if it's a kick like this first one, one that's very deep but that Washington could conceivably decide to return? Well, let's look at those eight return touchdowns of his. Almost none of those kicks even made it to the goal line. He doesn't usually even try returning kicks that go this far back, and when he has, he's never once scored a touchdown. Meanwhile, Bosher has been automatic today, placing every single one of his kickoffs in the territory where Washington has had no success. And just to keep all of this in perspective, Leon Washington has scored one kick return touchdown in the last two years. So while yes, anything can happen, worrying about this is kind of like worrying about getting hit by a meteor. If they're really that worried about it, they can always try a line drive kick or a squib kick. With either of those, the ball wouldn't go as far, but it's tough to field cleanly and almost impossible to return for a touchdown. What they do instead, with eight seconds left, and with the lead, is an onside kick. Listen, I can be somewhat normal about this because I've had time to process it, but if this is your first time seeing this, you should be yelling. This is the best explanation we can muster. We see Bosher turning his foot to strike the ball with his heel. He might have been attempting a misdirection squib, the idea being to make it look like you're attempting a straight ahead kick and then unexpectedly punching it to the other side of the field at the last moment. But no matter how many times Bosher has practiced this, it's a risky maneuver in the one situation the Falcons should be avoiding risk at all costs. While a squib may have been the intent, this is officially an onside kick. That's how it went down in the record book, and it's also functionally an onside kick, as it ends like onside kicks almost always do. The first line recovers it and gets excellent field position. Here's how bad this is. 
If Pete Carroll was allowed to walk over to the other sideline and call one play for the Falcons that would have any chance at letting the Seahawks back into the game, he would have asked for this, an onside kick. In the end, Seattle couldn't capitalize on this, but they had a timeout and a very, very real chance of setting up a last second field goal that would have knocked the Falcons out of the playoffs. It's difficult to find the words for this. After the game, Mike Smith said the most Mike Smith thing possible. These things happen in a ball game. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Interestingly, and likely because this debacle didn't affect the result, very little was made of it. There was that one question at the presser, and one passing, huh, that was weird, in the papers, and then it was lost to history. Very few of us remember that this team really almost threw away a 13-3 season on an onside kick when they already had the lead. My god, this is how it happens now, isn't it? The Falcons have always been defined by debacles, and they always will. Now that they're too buttoned up for disaster to strike on the radio, on a late night plane to Arkansas during media week, on a quiet street in Miami, on the sideline, in a press conference, or anywhere else, this chaos will, from this point forth, manifest on the field of play itself. The Falcons are back, baby! They never left! You little fucker, don't you scare me like that again! God, I love you! About that game as a whole, the AJC's Jeff Schultz wrote that it narrowly avoided becoming, quote, the flashpoint for all conversations on the greatest collapses and humiliating moments in Atlanta pro sports history. Yeah, be a real shame if that ever happened. Having just barely avoided what would have been one of the worst meltdowns in NFL history, the Falcons advanced to host their first ever conference title game against Colin Kaepernick and the San Francisco 49ers. Just like in the divisional round, the Falcons are off and running right out of the gate. Not only does Julio Jones get loose for a long touchdown to cap the first drive of the game, but after just 15 minutes and 6 seconds, he's already torched the Niners secondary for 120 receiving yards and this second TD that puts Atlanta up 17-0. Once again, they've built a 3-score lead, and once again, they forget how to play football once they do so. First, they allow this read option that gets the Niners on the board, then Cap finds Vernon Davis to all of a sudden make it just a 3-point game. Ryan and his ageless tight end are able to stem the tide just before halftime, and they maintain their double-digit lead at the break. But after Niner tailback Frank Gore's third-quarter touchdown, in the fourth, the Falcons come about as close as humanly possible to surrendering the lead when Michael Crabtree takes this slant within inches of the goal line, only for corner Dante Robinson to rip the ball away in the nick of time. However, Atlanta goes three and out to give the ball back to San Francisco, and this time, the Niners just lean on Gore, who powers into the end zone and hits him with a bird that sure as hell ain't clean, as the Falcons now somehow find themselves trailing. One week after blowing a huge lead, but still orchestrating a game-winning drive when they needed it the most, the exact same developments are so far unfolding the exact same way. Ryan has little trouble guiding his team into the red zone, only this time he needs a touchdown. On 4th and 4 from the 10-yard line, with just over a minute left and a berth in Super Bowl 47 riding on the play, he looks for White over the middle, but linebacker Navarro Bowman's well-positioned to sneak his left hand in there to break up the pass and end the Falcon season in heartbreaking fashion. This cemented the Falcons' reputation among NFL fans all across the country. This team doesn't just lose, it explodes. It made them a point of viewing. We knew we were in for a spectacle. Maybe they'd get clobbered on their own field like no other team has in modern times. Maybe they'd theatrically flare-flop and become the only team in NFL playoff history to finish with exactly two points on the scoreboard. If we were really lucky, we'd get a riveting double feature in which they jumped to a 20-0 playoff lead at home and a 17-0 playoff lead at home, and somehow blew both of them. We'd never seen anything like this. But there was another, longer story being told here. This was one of just four playoff duels in which both starting quarterbacks finished with a passer rating above 110. 
Matt Ryan threw for nearly 400 yards, and Colin Kaepernick, primarily known as a mobile quarterback, stayed behind the line and picked apart the Falcons from the air. Years down the road, both these men would do something unthinkable for NFL quarterbacks. They would become politically active. Kaepernick, the first star NFL player to directly challenge the state, would be completely hung out to dry by the league as a consequence. When he brought his protest against systemic oppression and murders at the hands of police through this bubble, it was interpreted instead as some kind of direct assault on the troops. For many, the actual message was completely vaporized, and the NFL was just fine with it. Years later in 2020, when the Black Lives Matter movement continued to build momentum, Ryan made a half million dollar donation toward Atlanta's black community and worked to raise a lot more. His only regret was that it took him so long to do it. In this moment in January 2013, these things would have been impossible to imagine. It's an important thing to remember, I think. The issues at hand were every bit as real then as they've ever been, but a team like the Atlanta Falcons was unmoored from any of it. And as it turned out, from the first period of sustained momentum they'd ever seen. This was right on time, wasn't it? This is how it goes every single time. The Falcons experience acts that last five years or so and then the curtain drops. This time, there were a lot of reasons we can identify. They released the aging John Abraham, as well as Michael Turner, and they also said goodbye to the man who'd been the cornerstone of their offensive line for the entire 21st century. Todd McClure is another one of those unsung heroes that we haven't really talked about, but replacing the center who snapped for Chris Chandler, Michael Vick, and Matt Ryan wasn't easy. On top of this, Julio Jones has lost injury for most of the season, and while Roddy White had a great year, he was hassled by the dreaded high ankle sprain that's every athlete's worst nightmare. Having come within nine minutes of his first ever Super Bowl appearance, Tony Gonzalez resolved to make one last run in 2013, and this is what he came back for. After one last failed campaign, the future Hall of Famer retired. 2014 wasn't much better, and yet, holding a 6-9 record entering the final game of the season, the Falcons actually had a chance of becoming one of the only teams ever to enter the playoffs with a losing record. All they had to do was beat a decidedly not good Carolina Panthers team at home in the Georgia Dome. They didn't just lose this game, they got clowned 34-3 in front of their own fans. And that was it for Mike Smith. The most successful coach in Falcons history was fired, ending an era of consistent winning this team had never before experienced. I gotta say, he made that cut pretty well. See the wing curves back in like that, and then see how it shoots back out just like it's supposed to? Huh. You know, they could have lost a little bit more down here and won a little bit more up here, you know, just to kind of round it out a little bit better. And around here, it, yeah, see up around the turn of the century, it gets a little bit more jagged than I'd like. But, you know, I don't want to nitpick. This is really, really impressive craftsmanship. Good work. Let's take one last look to enjoy this, because for the first time, they're about to cut completely outside the lines. To lead the latest iteration of their football team, the Falcons hired Seahawks defensive coordinator Dan Quinn. It looked to be an immediate hit when he kicked off his tenure by winning six of his first seven games. But in a bit of a Falcon hot start, cold finish tradition, they spiraled through a 2-7 stretch run to wind up 8-8, eight eight, one of just four instances during the 16-game era that a team started 6-1 and, and failed to finish with a winning record. In one of those losses in particular, Quinn made the most inexplicable decision I have ever seen a football coach make. Sometimes decisions by coaches get criticized after the fact simply because they happen to not succeed, though if they had, no one would have said a peep. I promise you, this is not that. No hindsight necessary here, because whereas most decisions involve multiple options that each have pros and cons just of varying degrees, Quinn once made a decision that only had cons. This was not simply a misjudgment of the sliding scale of pros and cons or risk and reward, because there was no sliding scale. It was week nine against the 49ers, and with just a few minutes left in the game, the Falcons were trailing by four points, but driving. This completion moved them to the doorstep of the goal line while bringing up fourth down. Dan Quinn, again, down four with little time remaining and the ball on the one yard line, opted to kick a three point field goal. The man figured after that field goal, in the span of three minutes, mind you, that generating a quick defensive stop, quickly working their way downfield into field goal range, and then hitting that field goal was more likely than his offense simply picking up a yard for a touchdown that'd give him the lead. 
What made this even more fingertip kissing delicious is that the football gods couldn't have set this up more poetically. Not only had the Falcons gone for it on fourth down the most of anyone in the league while converting 69% of the time, but the very prior week the Falcons encountered fourth and one not once, but twice. They went for it, not once, but twice. They were successful, not once, but twice. Now when it's the biggest no-brainer imaginable to go for it on 4th and 1, Quinn punts. Well, literally kicks, but he may as well have punted. Analytics calculators pegged the chance of a Falcon victory after the field goal at about 17%. Their chance at victory had they gone for the touchdown from the 1 yard line and failed would have been about 35% due to the fact that the Niners would have been forced to take over with terrible field position from the shadow of their own goal line. A successful field goal was more detrimental to the Falcons than if they'd failed at the alternative. Matt Ryan could have literally taken a fourth down knee while trailing and it still would have made them over twice as likely to win as a successful field goal did. The Falcons never touched the ball again. In the midst of their 2-7 freefall to close the season, one of those two wins was just the Falcons-iest. Entering Week 16, the Atlanta Falcons and Carolina Panthers were about as diametrically opposed as two football teams could possibly be. Across the previous eight weeks, the Falcons had been perhaps the league's worst team not quarterbacked by Johnny Manziel. Meanwhile, the Panthers were only the fourth team in NFL history to start 14-0, and as a cherry on top, they'd absolutely clobbered the Falcons 38-0 just two weeks earlier. And yet, quarterback Cam Newton's quest to lead his team to perfection got upended in the penultimate game in his native Atlanta. The Falcons are funny like that. After 2015, the team released Roddy White, who ultimately never played another down in the NFL. This left Matt Ryan and Julio Jones as the only two major holdovers from those winning years. This is usually about the time we'd wrap things up. But in fact, the 2016 season is the one that's compelled us to tell the story of the 50 seasons that came before it. All of this was a half century of prologue. This is the season that defines the Atlanta Falcons, and might define them forever. While Ryan had an up and down season in 2015 as he learned the complexities of new offensive coordinator Kyle Shanahan's system, everything clicked as he mastered it in year two. Their 33.8 points per game in 2016 were one of the highest single season totals ever, and the foundation for their unstoppable offense was an ability to do whatever the hell they wanted on first down, where they averaged an astronomical 7.6 yards per first down play. Ryan was surgical from start to finish and won MVP after throwing for nearly 5,000 yards, 38 touchdowns, and just seven interceptions. He received half of the 50 votes, and that simply was not enough. The runner-up got 10 votes, and while Tom Brady was the only quarterback in Ryan's solar system in most rate metrics, even he didn't come within a full yard of Ryan's NFL record 9.3 yards per pass. And oh yeah, he also missed a quarter of the season thanks to a pretty cool air pressure based suspension, so he lagged way behind in terms of volume too. The MVP voting should have been even more of a landslide for Ryan. 2016 was a season in which, and this is not one bit hyperbolic, Matt Ryan played the position of quarterback at just about the highest level it can be played. It can pretty safely be considered one of the three or four greatest single seasons of passing in NFL history, likely just behind 2004 Peyton Manning and 2011 Aaron Rodgers, and alongside a couple other debatable ones. It wouldn't be a great one, but a non-outrageous case can be crafted that it was the all-time pinnacle. Now, this fall, the fall of 2016, is the one that we all remember in vivid detail. And here we are, right in the middle of it, talking about Matt Ryan's passing efficiency and the Atlanta Falcons' success rate on first down. That's exactly what these Falcons have always been, right? Alternate programming. Literally. 
84 million people were glued to the first Trump-Clinton debate, the most in American history. You want to know what the Falcons were doing at this exact same hour? Playing the Saints. Well, they did it again. Now, as always, the Falcons offered us an escape hatch from the real world. And you know what? If I had it to do over again, I'd watch this instead. I mean, what, was my vote gonna change? If I turned on Falcon Saints, I would've had way more fun and learned the exact same amount. These two TV shows had quite a few things in common. You could argue that a lot of partisan viewers hated the opposing team more than they liked their own. We didn't want to better our understanding of anything, we wanted to collect ammo to talk shit to the other side. The big difference, apart from Falcon Saints being way more fun, was that... Well, I guarantee you that the average Falcons or Saints player genuinely cared about and loved their fans and wanted to deliver something for them. As for those two... <laughs> Moving on. What would turn out to be their final loss of 2016 came in week 13 against the Chiefs, when they took just enough time out of their busy schedule to invent a brand new way to lose a football game. It had never before been done. Down by five with four and a half minutes left, Ryan finds Aldrick Robinson in the end zone. They now have a one point lead and have made the decision to go for two instead of kicking the extra point. Smart, because a three point lead would safeguard him against the Chiefs kicking a last minute field goal to win the game. Just a year and a half prior, the NFL tweaked its rule book to allow the defense on a two point conversion attempt to return the turnover for a touchdown. The way it had worked for decades was, if you intercepted it, it was a dead ball and the play was over. Now, it would be technically legal to run back a new variant of the pick six, the pick two. I don't think any of these 11 Falcons are even considering this remote possibility, but Fairburn Georgia's own Eric Berry is, and when Ryan tries to find tight end Austin Hooper in the end zone, he jumps all over it. This play is functionally a done deal before Barry's even at the 30. What follows here is a fascinating sound. It's not booing. It's not one resounding no, and it's not silence. It sounds like a 70,000 person stock exchange as the market drops a thousand points. They're shouting in sentence fragments as they attempt to process in real time that yes, this is legal now. Everyone's caught on their heels, including the CBS production team, who's only ready to go Chiron for a two point score, understandably is safety. And this was not a safety, it was a pick two. And while there have been a few other pick twos in the NFL, this was the one and only time a team has ever lost a lead during their own two point conversion attempt which is like getting your ass kicked at your own birthday party. Magnificent. Dan Quinn had taken some heat in 2015 after his Falcons fell apart down the stretch, and an embarrassment like that seemed to be the perfect time for it to happen again. Instead, they took advantage of a weak schedule, caught fire, and wiped the floor with everyone. They flew into LA and built a 42 to nothing lead on the Rams before ambivalently allowing a couple of meaningless late scores. They hosted Colin Kaepernick in one of the last games he'd ever play. Though Kaepernick played well, the Niners defense, which in that season was one of the worst of all time, was bullied downfield all afternoon. The Falcons then went to Charlotte and neutralized Cam Newton 33-16, and to cap off the regular season they went up 38-13 on the Saints and withstood their comeback attempt. It was only the second time they'd ever finished a season with four straight wins, the other being their Super Bowl season in 98. But there's always a but. They did that across kind of an easy schedule. We've watched this happen before, with the Falcons barging into the playoffs with an inflated record and getting disposed of by the real contenders. Things were different now. With Ryan sitting on just one career playoff win through eight seasons, his next chance at his second comes against Quinn's old team that he beat for that lone victory four years earlier. In this one, an opening drive touchdown pass from Russell Wilson to Jimmy Graham digs Atlanta into an early hole. But this Falcon squad has lived in the end zone all season, and their first possession ends no other way, with Julio Jones knifing in to tie it up early in the second quarter. A few minutes later, with Atlanta down three, Wilson's foot gets stepped on by his own O lineman to give Atlanta another of those ultra-rare playoff safeties. 
Near the end of the first half, though, they accomplish something even more rare. This Matt Ryan scoring toss to a wide open Tevin Coleman caps just the second postseason 99 yard touchdown drive in 15 years and gives the Falcons a 9 point lead at intermission. They open the second half with a long, methodical touchdown drive, and in this one, they never allow the Seahawks to mount a late comeback, as for once, Matt Ryan can enjoy a stress-free playoff game down the stretch. This was the Falcons' final season in the Georgia Dome after a quarter century, and since Green Bay edged Dallas in the other NFC semifinal the next day, that meant it would host one last game against the Packers for the right to advance to Super Bowl 51. It will be their fourth all-time playoff matchup after ping-ponging between an easy Packer win in the June Jones era, an easy Falcon win in the Dan Reeves era, and an easy Packer win in the Mike Smith era. Early signs point toward that oscillation continuing when the Falcons end their first possession with this little flip from Ryan to Mohamed Sanu for the score and early advantage. In the second quarter, they're up 10-0, but the Packers are driving down near Atlanta's 10-yard line when corner Jalen Collins yanks the ball away from fullback Aaron Ripkowski and recovers it for the touchback. That sets up Matt Ryan channeling his inner Mike Vick with a personal record 14-yard touchdown run. For the second time in five years, the Falcons have a 17-0 lead in the NFC Championship game. In that one, they crumbled. In this one, they smell blood. With just seconds left in the first half, Julio Jones, limited all week by a bum toe, looks like it's okay here as he taps those toes inbounds for the touchdown. Their offense has scored 24 points and the defense has pitched a first half shutout. The Falcons can do no wrong. Halftime does nothing to dampen the Georgia Dome party either. On Atlanta's second play of the second half, Julio fights through a blatant hold on his dig route, then shrugs off like gnats multiple Packers trying to bring him down on his way to a grown man 73-yard touchdown and a 31-0 lead that nearly brings the Dome crashing down about 10 months ahead of schedule. The final 29 minutes are nothing more than garbage time. The Packers get on the board as the teams trade some late, meaningless touchdowns, but the Falcons ultimately cruise to a 44-21 win that punches their ticket to Houston, Texas for another chance to bring a Super Bowl title to the city of Atlanta. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, Shame on me. Every season of Falcons football, no matter how agonizing it ended, I was back every year ready to be a fool. I would put on my dumb jersey and stupid little hat every week, hoping that this year would be our year. And of course it never was. They would blind you with impressive records, snagging number one seeds in the conference, only to fall hilariously flat on their faces. It was like the goddamn Charlie Brown scene, where Lucy pulls the ball right before he kicks it, sending Charlie spiraling into the air. That's what almost every single season felt like. We had the pieces, we had the talent. We even had a great running start, only to whiff when it mattered most every time. Getting our ass kicked at home by the Packers, scoring two whole points against the Giants, blowing a double-digit lead with a chance to go to the Super Bowl against the 49ers. The Falcons had found new and creative ways to lose, which, when you think about it, was actually quite impressive. It was the standard. Falcons fans knew the team would eventually fold, but we waited to see how they could possibly one-up themselves when presented with a new opportunity. And they never failed. But the 2016 season, for whatever reason, just felt different. We were running teams off the field. 
The offense was damn near impossible to stop, that it felt like any given week they were ready to hang at least 40 points on whoever lined up in front of them. But the ass whoopings just weren't reserved for the regular season. The Falcons looked hellbent on righting the wrongs of their laughable history to prove to everyone who doubted them that this team is legit. It felt like all the stars were aligning for Atlanta at the right time, because they were. On the weekend the Falcons were enjoying their playoff bye, fellow ATLian Donald Glover's show Atlanta won two Golden Globe Awards. In his acceptance speech, Glover made sure to shout out the city that made him, but also took a moment to congratulate Atlanta rap trio Migos for not only appearing in his show, but for making the song Bad and Bougie, which Glover said was the best song ever. Glover later went on to speak facts and said that the Migos were the Beatles of this generation which is a hill that a lot of Atlanta folk will gladly die on. The very next day, Bad and Bougie reached number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart, only to knock off fellow Atlanta rappers Ray Shrimmer and Gucci Mane's smash hit Black Beatles. Sports, television, and music were all dominated by representatives in the A. On the other end of the spectrum, Atlanta's actual representative, civil rights icon John Lewis, rest his soul, said a few weeks later that he didn't view President-elect Donald Trump as a legitimate president. Which of course Trump fired back at in only a way he can, with a barrage of tweets aimed at a man who fought for equal rights in this country. Sad. So not only were the sports and the culture of Atlanta taking over the world, but our politicians spoke up and had the guts to say what was on everyone's mind at the time. Every single thing was clicking for the Falcons and the city of Atlanta. During that run, you couldn't tell me or anyone else from the A shit. This was our moment. This was a fan base who had been through the depths of hell, only to pull within one win of hoisting the Lombardi Trophy. It was destiny. It was fate. Whatever you want to call it, we were ready to embrace it all. The Atlanta Falcons had destroyed all comers. This team was rolling into the Super Bowl hotter than almost any other team in history. They were riding a six game win streak, which only a third of Super Bowl teams had ever done. Of those teams, their point differential along that stretch of games was the highest in 20 years. Having scored 118 more points than they'd allowed, it was a tidal wave of momentum, unseen since the Packers in 96. It was an entirely different story than that of the 98 Falcons, who squeaked out victories down the stretch and barely made it in. This was a monster. This was a team to be scared of. The Falcons clinched their Super Bowl appearance in the NFC Championship game at around 6.30 p.m. that Sunday. Minutes later, the AFC Championship game kicked off to determine their opponent. They watched and waited. A little before 10 p.m., they had company. Unbelievably, an AFC champion had emerged with almost identically strong momentum. That night, the Falcons learned that they, unlike any other team that had ever come before them, would represent the hopes and dreams of untold millions. After 50 years of flying blissfully away from the troubles of the world, the Atlanta Falcons had landed directly in the center of the universe. <laughs> 